I think uh, uh, I guess we can go ahead and get started. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Manav Shroff. Uh, I'm from HP Global Analytics, um, and I have my colleagues Subhashish Mishra and Biswajit Pal uh, along with me to talk about some of the exciting work uh, that we are doing in the customer analytics area, um, and you know how how it is relevant for uh, all of us, uh, right? So. Uh, the, topic for our dis the topic of our discussion for today is, I know uh, what you are going to do next summer. Uh, pretty exciting, right? Uh, can we really know that? Uh, to a certain extent, yes. Uh, we, you know, we have used uh, you know, certain advanced statistical techniques uh, to marry with uh, some important business problems that manifest themselves uh, in the customer intelligence, customer analytics, customer retention kind of a domain. Uh, where we really try to predict, uh, you know, who will really purchase from us next and when will he purchase. Uh, and by being able to make those predictions, uh, we are able to uh, target our customers better with the right product choices at the right time, with the right offers, and so on and so forth. Uh, so for the discussion today, uh, the agenda in the, for the next uh, 25 or 30 minutes is, uh, I'll first talk about the customer analytics paradigm. Uh, so how does the work that we have done, and it's pretty uh, technical stuff, really fit into the um, entire business perspective, right? So I'll talk about that first. Uh, and then, you know, I'll hand it over to my uh, colleague Subhashish to really talk about uh, some of the techniques around Bayesian hierarchical model. And it gets pretty deep into, uh, into those techniques um, that we have used to kind of marry the business problem with an analytical solution. And then how we kind of improv improvise our original model uh, to be, uh, you know, big data relevant, and then we'll conclude with what are the next steps we are doing, and open up for questions uh, in the last five to seven minutes uh, for the audience, right? So uh, let me just start by, uh, you know, showing you some numbers. Uh, research shows that uh, it is six to seven times costlier to acquire a new customer than to retain an existing one. Right. Uh, it's not a surprising thing. How many of you would, it, would have not, uh, you know, expected that? A show of hands, please. Right. So no brainer. Every, you know, mostly everyone knows that. Research also shows that if companies could increase uh, customer retention by an incremental five percent or so, it has significant impact on overall profitability to the tune of five to ninety-five percent. So what I'm trying to drive here is that customer retention as a, uh, you know, as a, 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 a uh, kind of a activity for our organizations is really imperative to drive profitable growth and create brand perception uh, within customers' mind, uh, which is everlasting. And so uh, from HP's perspective, uh, we take customer retention as one of our most important activities in the customer intelligence and customer analytics uh, domain. Customer is at the core of everything we do. So what is the customer analytics paradigm at HP? Uh, really, uh, our key goal, if you, if you ask any of us uh, who are customer analytics practitioners, uh, our key goal is to minimize the customer information asymmetry. Uh, what I mean by that, there is an inherent gap between what I know about my customer versus what I want to know. And this gap always exists. But how can I minimize this gap? By continuously creating a uh, you know, 360 degree holistic view of a customer. And what we do at HP is uh, we combine all of the customer data, which is customer transaction information, uh, every touch point information with our customer, for example, when a customer calls our service center, if he has a problem with a laptop or a printer, we collect that information. If, you know, if a customer goes to hp.com and browses there or buys a product there, we have his web browsing information. You know, if a customer buys warranty from us, we have that information. And you know, when a customer calls us to say something is not working, we have that information as well. And if a customer tells us what he would like HP to do uh, better, we have that information. So when we integrate all this information together and bring it all together to create a single view, we really understand what a customer is doing today. 
right? The next uh, layer that we add to it is we try to also gather external information about our customers. What are they so saying in the social blogs, in the social media? Uh, reports that we buy from uh, syndicated information providers to understand the market better, right? Once we augment this data with our base level data, which is our internal transaction, customer transaction, demographic information, and so on and so forth, we really have the ability to answer some of the questions like why is a customer doing something that he's doing? And really the crux of the matter is the, the deep why insight, uh, you know, how do we then take all this information together to predict what a customer will do next? And when we are able to do that, we are able to have meaningful conversations with our cost customers rather than random interactions, right? So if I know that someone has bought a laptop three years back from HP, he's ready for a refresh in the next two or three months because a refresh rate of a laptop is about three years. And at that point in time, if I offer him a laptop product, you know, it will probably make a lot of sense to him and resonate to him. But if someone has bought a laptop, you know, last month, and I start sending him offers to buy more laptops this month. Do you think that will make sense? Right? So, you know, really the, the imperative is how do we have, uh, you know, in so, so much information about customers and so relevant information that we can make those internet, uh, intelligent uh, decisions on how we interact with our customers. So everything that we do uh, on the customer analytics, customer intelligence paradigm is uh, with three key goals in mind. Number one, to improve our customer retention and cross-sell metrics. Number two, to improve our marketing effectiveness. We spend millions of dollars on marketing. How can we do, uh, how can we generate more sales with less? And third, is to create a brand perception about HP in our customer's mind, which is beyond reason. And those are the three imperatives that each one of us think about as customer analytics practitioners at HP. Uh, having said that, uh, today, for today's discussion, we'll focus on the first piece, which is the customer retention, uh, and how we have married the business problem of improving customer retention with some advanced statistical techniques and married this together to create a significant business impact in, in, in the marketing that we do to our customers. Right at this point, I'll uh, invite my colleague, Savushish, uh, to talk about uh, the, you know, the, the technical aspects and you know, what statistics uh, and that brain power that was used to really marry this business problem with the uh, statistical outcome. Okay. Audible now? Okay. Uh, Arun folks, so let me jump uh, right into the heart of the analytical problem here. And to do that, let us consider the typical time points uh, in the transaction history of a consumer. Okay. So he of course starts off, and this is first major milestone, uh, when he starts off with his first purchase. Let's say at time point T0 there. Okay. He goes on to make multiple purchases as ex exemplified by say points, uh, you know, T1, T2, etc. Now, the last record that we have of him making a purchase is at time point Tx. Uh, the exact question that we seek to answer here is what are his chances or probability, that is, to make a purchase between Tx and another time point, capital T, in the future. Okay. Now, to do that, we start off with modeling some of the more important uh, consumer transaction decisions as a probability distributions. Okay. More importantly, uh, we model the number of time that a customer, so let's say J, transacts as a Poisson distribution with a rate parameter lambda J. So lambda J essentially, like I said, is a rate parameter, which means that if this guy uh, transacts <laughs> 10 times and my unit of time is days, then his rate would be 10 by 365. Okay. Um, secondly, uh, we model his chances of dropping off after a, a transaction you know, as a binomial distribution with parameter pj. So for our purposes, his chances of churn, that is his chances of no more being an HP customer is p, okay? And, and so on and so forth. But these are the two major cornerstone assumptions of analysis. 
having said that, let us assume uh, that we are aware of, uh, let's say we have an estimate, a good estimate of P and lambda for a particular consumer. In that case, uh, his chances of making a purchase between Tx and the time point in the future, cap T, can be very well represented by the expression that we see there, 1 minus P thing. Uh, and how? Okay, let, let's step back a bit. What we said is that his chances of churn are P, right? So, mm -hmm. elementary probability. Uh, 1 minus P essentially give me the complement of that event. That is, his chances that he's still around. He's still my customer. He's going to make a purchase, right? Now, I will assume that number of times he purchases follow a well, so Poisson distribution with rate parameter lambda j. In that case, uh, let's not work it out, but his chances of making zero purchases, that he does not purchase at all, is given by this right-hand side term. E to the power of minus lambda t minus tx, okay? Again, this is a chance of making a zero purchase. So one minus that would give me the complement given that he makes at least a purchase, okay? Which means, this entire expression uh, tells me that the chances, what are his chances that he still survived, he's still my loyal customer, and he'll make at least uh, many a purchase. Trickling in. All right? I'm going to start. In that case, this whole expression might as well be very well used as the scoring this equation side. for a repeat purchase up. phenomena. Essentially, which means that everyone? we need good representative good morning, values everyone. of lambda and P for a and customer. That's my and we can Ganesh feed this into this equation and get a repeat purchase score Grano for the time span under consideration. Now, this is a talk how do we do that? Uh, That's what we are going to consider text. next time we are going to explain. Okay? Now, uh, if we, you know, do have uh, uh, this individual level, this probability assumptions, it's like I said, uh, for, you know, uh, Poisson distribution for transactions and binomial for chances of dropping out, we can formulate what's called the individual level likelihood function for the, uh, for the particular consumer. And via that, the whole, you know, maximum likelihood function for the, all the consumers and hence the data itself. Now, uh, this is where exactly the classical paradigm of, uh, you know, statistic stops. What you do is you kind of uh, choose values of the important parameters so as to maximize what's called a likelihood function and uh, get to the parameters of interest. What we have done further on is, uh, you know, just to exploit the fact that there is heterogeneity in consumers and across consumers. And that's really the beauty of the Bayesian paradigm. So uh, what we have assumed is that uh, lambda and P varies across the population as a gamma distribution and a beta distribution respectively. Uh, so in, in the paradigm, mm -hmm. some things that we are talking about, the Bayesian paradigm, these are called priors of the distribution, lambda and P, all right? Following the same paradigm, uh, this prior distributions into my likelihood, you know, function of the data would teach me what's called as the uh, po complete posterior distributions of the parameter of interest, okay? Uh, in this case, lambda and p. So this is kind of a joint distribution, probability distribution function of the lambdas and p's that we have considered. In our case, this complete posterior distribution is in a complicated form and it's really very difficult to directly sample from. So what we did was, you know, uh, use something called a uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation schemes, uh, a GIF sampler essentially, which is a, a simple form of, you know, just a form of MCMC sch sampling schemes to draw uh, values of, representative values of lambda and p, okay? Uh, now, of course, uh, we have considered a normative test to assume that the posterior distributions converged, you know. Uh, we have used diagnostics to see, you know, that, uh, that it's converged well and stuff. Uh, uh, and and uh, it's also important to point out at this juncture uh, that the necessary data uh, for this analysis is just, you know, three transaction variables, very basic transaction variables, uh, the uh, consumer's first purchase time, a consumer's last purchase time, and number of times he has transacted, nothing beyond that. So that speaks that, you know, about the power of this approach. Uh, now, now uh, once we have, uh, you know, representative values of lambda and p, uh, we get a whole range of lambda and p values, of course, from the simulation scheme. That's what this throws up at the end of the day. Uh, what we need, essentially, uh, is to do, uh, is take, you know, representative values of lambda and p for a particular consumer, right? Of course, we can take a mean or a median that give us some kind of a central estimate of lambda and p for a particular consumer. And once we have that, we can feed it back into the equation in the earlier slide. That kind of gives me the <laughs> repeat purchase of propensity score for a consumer in the time period, Tx to T, under consideration. Now, uh, this sampling scheme that we had designed, this entire algorithm was uh, devised in an open source tool. I, I'm sure many of you are aware of it by this time. It's called R, which is a really cool uh, statistical computing tool. It's free. 
and it has loads of packages and can do really cutting edge analysis. Okay. Now, uh, once done with this, uh, we figured that you know uh, it, 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 it's a fairly accurate approach. When we used it to identify repeat prospects, it did really well. Uh, it was implemented through open source, which was again very cool. Uh, but it had a slight problem uh, in terms of the computation time it used to take. You see, the simulations that we are talking about uh, are really very computationally intensive, and it takes a whole lot of time to run. Uh, to give a hint of it, it just take about uh, 1,800 minutes to score about a million consumers. Now, for a company uh, like HP, which has databases running into you know, hundreds of millions of consumers, uh, that's the that's problem. This makes it unscalable in some ways. Uh, at this juncture, we figured that we needed to uh, you know, modify this approach a bit to make it more suitable in the big data analytics scenario. And this is exactly uh, the modifications that my uh, colleague Vishwaji is going to talk about next. Right? So over to you, Vishwaji. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, so I will take the last part of the session. Uh, so as Shubhashi has pointed out, and uh, this is one of the drawbacks of the Bayesian hierarchical model, that it takes a long time to score a large database. And uh, in our scenario, the database is for like 100 million customer and it's a transactional database. So you can understand uh, that how much data it has. So this is the point where we thought that uh, maybe a, a good you know, a approximation should be a good idea. And approximated in that sense, what we thought is that a good scoring algorithm, which has a property that if the two customers have the same values for the explanatory variables, ha will have a similar score. If such kind of scoring algorithms we use for approximation, then I think it should, be a, it should uh, do a good job for us. So in that scenario, we thought that uh, a sufficiently parameterized regression model might uh, suffice our purpose. So what we did uh, was a regression framework. Now in this framework, now uh, just to recap, as Shubhashish pointed out that in Bayesian hierarchical model, uh, we uh, estimate two parameters. One is the probability of churn, that is the P, and another is the rate of purchase, which is the lambda using three basic uh, transaction variable, which is the first purchase, last purchase, and the frequency of purchase. So we, we used a similar approach uh, for the regression methodology as well. So we built a separate model, uh, one for P and one for lambda, using those explanatory variable, which we have used in the uh, Bayesian hierarchical method. In terms of modeling technique, uh, we started off with the ordinary least square regression. Now it gave a good fit. But the problem happened uh, when we actually uh, started comparing what is the actual error between the actual values and the predicted values. And there, we don't get a, a result what we're expecting to do a good approximation. So then, we moved into a, a technique called generalized additive model, or GAM. So what GAM does, and how it is different from uh, linear regression, is that the GAM explains both the linearity as well as the linear, non-linearity aspect of the data. Now, the nonlinearity aspect get covered by a function called smooth polynomial function called spline function. Now, the result when we, when we tested the GAM on our database, the result was really good. The, act, the error between the actual and the predicted was just around 1%, and that's what we are expecting to get a good approximation. But there is a slight issue. I'll not say in terms of execution, but in terms of when we present these equations to business. Now, the spline function, which is there in the GAM, it's, it's in the closed form. So when you present it to the business, so it's little difficult them to explain it. So what we thought, that because spline is a polynomial function, if we use a polynomial regression instead uh, using the output of GAM, it might give a similar result, and it will be much easier to explain it to business. So actually, we went ahead and did a polynomial regression, and it was working the similar way what GAM was working, like the, uh, the, uh, the error was around 1%. So essentially what we did, we actually approximated the whole Bayesian method using a regression polynomial equation. And what are the advantages of it? So the immediate advantages was the scalability, which was the main issue with the Bayesian model. So for, for say, scoring a 10 million customer, the Bayesian model was taking around three days of time that got reduced within an hour in our case, using a regression polynomial. And secondly, in terms of accuracy also, like when we tested both the models in our internal database, both the model captures around 60% of the converters in, in our top three deciles. So uh, are you people aware of the lift chart or 
means how many of you are aware of the lift chart? Okay, so I'll just explain it. So in this lift chart, uh, this diagonal indicates that uh, the conversion rate when, when, it, when we did do a random targeting and this graphs above are the conversion rate when we do a regression framework or any kind of modeling technique. So if you concentrate in the top three decile, what essentially we are saying that if we do a random targeting, we capture 30% here. In comparison, we are capturing around 60% if we do any, use any one of the methods that is regression or Bayesian. So essentially, we are giving a 2x lift to the business in terms of the conversion rate, which is a pretty good uh, you know, uh, accomplishment. So, so this is what we did in terms of the approximation part. So essentially, the next question comes, how this whole framework will be used by business. So how business will use it? So this is our customer database where we have the transaction data lies. So what they will do, they will pick up the main three transaction variable which we use. That is the timing of first purchase, timing of last purchase, and frequency of purchase. Then this is the whole repeat model. I mean, this will, this will be a sort of black box for them. But in terms of uh, explaining it, so we will do a Bayesian hierarchical method. We will estimate the P and lambda. Then we will use those input in our regression-based approximation, get the polynomial equation, values for P and lambda, plug in to the repeat purchase equation, get the repeat purchase probability. Now when we do this for the entire database, we will have re repeat propensity score for the entire database. And post that, the marketing can use it in uh, various ways. So it can do effective marketing, and it also, you know, like what, what it helps essentially is that we are targeting the right customers at right time. So we are not bombarding uh, emails or direct mails to customers who are not going to purchase from us right now. And this actually lead to a good customer experience. And essentially, this whole framework has various advantages. First in, one is accuracy. In terms of accuracy, we already mentioned that, you know, top three decile contains about 65% uh, of the converter. And when business used it in their marketing campaign, they got a significant lift in terms of incremental sales. So when they used in the last year holiday season campaign, the incremental sales were about 25% of the total sales, both for the direct and the email uh, campaigns. Second thing is the scalability. So in scalability, currently, what we do with this algorithm, we score around 100 million of customer less than a half day's time. So in four, four or five hours, we can score 100 million of customers. And lastly, the diversity. Uh, as you, you know, if you re recollect, uh, our whole algorithm was based on three basic uh, transaction variables. First purchase, last purchase, and frequency of purchase. So these are, these are the three basic uh, variables which, which are available to any marketer and any, uh, across any industry. So anybody can use this algorithm in order to score their customer and get the repeat purchase. <coughs> and also, this, this particular model can be used with various other models to solve various important uh, you know, marketing problem. And one of them we are currently trying, which is the customer lifetime value. So what we are doing, uh, and what is customer lifetime value? So right now, we have assigned a propensity score to, uh, to each customer. But if we can actually tie up a monetary value for each customer, that will help business to segment them into three or two or three groups, and then uh, you know, target them accordingly. So what we are doing here currently, we have the repeat propensity score with, with us. So we know which customers are actually converting, uh, have the likelihood to convert. We have also the rate of purchase, which is the intermediary output. So if we, if we can devise an algorithm that will actually predict that what will be the next most likely product, just a second, then we can actually score the customer lifetime value with it. And that's what we are trying. So, uh, so you know, to wrap up the whole session, what we did here is that we used some advanced analytical method and also some simple as well in order to solve a critical business problem uh, and then generate some incremental revenue for the, for the business. And I think that's all for the session, and uh, now we'll be opening up for the questions. Just one or two questions. So, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question is about the slide that you showed where you said it's about 26% holiday season incremental yeah. sales. Uh, I would like to understand from the statistical analysis that you did, how was the attribution for this 26%? Did the business come back and then tell you that 
look, I have in principle taken and implemented your statistical analysis and therefore yes, this is or is it derived from your end? That's it. No, uh, what we, so what we typically do, uh, you know, like uh, when a campaign goes, it has various segments, the target. So few segments are picked up from our uh, repeat purchase model and few they use some business rules. So what we typically measure is that the business rule we considered as a no model kind of scenario. Basically these are the list which where business haven't used our model to pick up. And then we cal basically we, we uh, generate a test and control kind of scenario here and then calculate the incremental sales. Yeah. It's, it's the standard champion challenger methodology. Standard champion challenger. Uh, I have a question which is very typical in terms when we do the Bayesian analysis or Bayesian hierarchical modeling. You sh shown the posterior probability and prior probability. What about the cases which is very true for a co product companies like HP or electronic companies which bring up very new product which was not there in the market till yesterday. And there is no, no prior probability of people buying it or liking it or not liking it. So that event has never occurred that this particular product like a particular kind of gadget which has never purchased before. So how you taken care of that kind of scenario? So, so typically uh, we have not assumed such products into this case. These are products that have uh, been there and it's just modeling some of the consumer decisions. It's more like a purchase decision. We have not modeled the introduction of product as a Bayesian framework as out here. So For uh, some of the new product introductions, we have a little different type of modeling techniques that we use. So this only captures information where we have existing products. And typically when we launch a new product, it is typically within a particular category. For example, it's a uh, high price category, right? And we basically launch a product within a high price category. So from some of the past transactions, we'll know exactly who are more like to likely to buy our high, pr you know, high price products. Uh, that will solve some piece of the problem, but we also have some very specific models to target uh, with, with the uh, you know, pieces where we have new product introductions. So, Ashish, uh, yeah, this question is on the hierarchical Bayesian model, uh, okay. whatever you presented. So, one, one assumption uh, with the standard Poison is IID, right? I mean, ident identical independent distributor. Correct. Okay. Uh, and I assume this is uh, this model is used on a lot of HP products, right, from toners to printers and everything mm -hmm. of that sort. The non-identical part is explained when you say different customers are different, given different lambdas and things like that. Mm -hmm. But there is a time series aspect to it. Correct. And that's not very. I mean, that assumption is laid out, not very laid out. For example, you are mm -hmm. treating every time period similarly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, yeah. that's an issue. So are you suggesting to say that? Uh, okay. So is that, are, you, are you trying to say that uh, you know that the observations across the past have to be uh, autocorrelated in some ways? They have to have a correlation structure. Are they, are that, is that what you're trying to say? Yeah. So that time aspect was something that uh, we had not considered. But then, uh, uh, in the in the repeat purchase phenomena itself, uh, you know. The posteriors we are getting are a kind of a uh, distribution, a kind of a function of his past pattern. Hold the mic. Sorry. Hold the mic. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. So essentially, we have not considered the uh, autocorrelations patterns as such, but then the posteriors from which we finally get the sample are a function of his past transaction behaviors, right? So in that way, I suppose it's getting reflected, but explicitly, as in autocorrelation functions inside the posterior? No, that has not been. Okay. Uh, so my question is that you have considered three variables, which are pretty simple, like, you know, last, first, and uh, number of purchases. But is it so simple because things like seasonality and things like, you know, uh, you have a product ecosystem and there are internal dependencies, like, you know, I don't buy cartilage unless and until I buy a printer. So how do you incorporate those dependencies into your model, like, you know? Could you repeat that again? Can you? Uh, So, so uh, one way perhaps, uh, again, is to specifically, you know, devise our priors in some way, devise our priors so as to incorporate that, but I suppose it will be pretty complicated. That's one thing that 
we are on so as to incorporate that in the price. Another way, if you really want to incorporate these variables, would be to maybe build a fully parameterized model. So just maybe build something like a you know a regression-like model, let's say, because these guys these are variables, right? Essentially, something like a logistic regression or survival modeling, things like that, a parameter model, a traditional, you know, classical approach model sort of a thing, that could take care of it. Having said that, what you've seen is that by via this, this approach, this vision approach, and using only these three variables, we're getting a decent enough result. Yes, I'm sure that the more enriched your model is in terms of information, the better result you'll get. And if you can make it that strong enough to incorporate these variables into the bright distributions or in the framework, I'm sure we'll get various better lifts in that way. Cannot hear you. Sorry. Correct. You use some post processing, like you know, uh, certain rules you. you know, no. So the final uh, posterior that we get, the lambdas and p's that we talked no, about. I'm talking about the final campaign, the final uh -huh. selection, one to hundred customers. So you're saying while do targeting, do we use those things? Post processing, like you know. No, actually, uh, you know, typically in our uh, targeting scenario. And the business, uh, suppose uh, business want to target say 100 customers. So it's not that all the customers are targeted using our model. So suppose 50 goes through our model and 50 they hold out for some say business rule or something like that. And at the end of the day they compare both the segments and they finally come out that how much incremental lift is coming. And that's the way it, it is designed. Okay, we'll break for tea right now and be back at 4 p.m. Thank you guys. <laughs>